All right. Thank you all for coming out and joining us today to have this conversation about what's going on with the workforce and these, uh, I was about to say it's, it's troubling times, but they've been troubling for a while now with, with regard to workforce. Uh, so we've got uh, Gene here, who, who your organization has been looking at this stuff uh, for a long time, but really taking a hard look at it for about 18 years now. For That's right. how long it's been on the high risk list. So right. let's start off talking about what's gone on over the last two decades and why workforce issues are still considered one of the highest risks to government operations. Yeah, Aaron, the, uh, the fundamental reason that we have it on the high risk list, and we put it on in 2001, was because of critical mission skill gaps in a number of agencies. In fact, we have 35 areas on the high risk list. 16 of those are on the high risk list in part because of critical mission skill gaps. Mm -hmm. There are some government-wide gaps and gaps at individual agencies. For example, we have contract management at DOD, DOE, NASA, and VA on the high risk list. Uh, so there are acquisition management issues across government. We have, and I put the, the cybersecurity on the high risk list government wide in 1997. So I was concerned back then, and we added critical infrastructure protection in 2003. We have IT acquisitions and operations government wide on the high risk list. So there are clearly critical skill gaps in the IT and cyber areas as well, but individual agencies um, at VA, medical care, there are doctors, nurses, healthcare, uh, human resource professionals, there are skill gaps there at energy, petroleum engineers, NASA, cost estimating, and uh, earned value management, as well as uh, you know, avionics and other issues. So, so there are critical skill gaps, and I'm, I'm very concerned mm. about the federal workforce because these gaps aren't getting addressed and the nature of the work is becoming more complicated, uh, and I th fear that given budgetary pressures, uh, we're going to see even more difficulties emerging in the performance of federal agencies. Because we look at it as, you know, you're not going to perform well if you don't have the right people, uh, and you need to have the right skills. And government work is getting more complicated, not less. And so you need higher level skills. Mm. So much I want to unpack out, of, uh, unpack out of that, including I want to touch on things like where this problem has come from, what kind of solutions you all have seen. Uh, but I want to start with something you just said right there at the end, which is the work's going to get harder. Uh, we, talk, we hear a lot about things like automation and AI, right? Those are some of the big tech things that are coming in. Uh, and that feels like it, it could be a double-edged edged sword here, uh, where automation could make some of the work easier. That was the great promise of automation, you know, back in the science fiction days before this was becoming a real thing where we thought we could work less because the robots would help us do more. Is that not what you're seeing? Well, I think, you know, technology is definitely an answer and a solution to a lot of difficulties. But the government has a very poor track record of implementing technology advancements. Of the 90 million dollars, or billion, excuse me, 90 billion dollars that it's spent each year, on IT and across government, 75% of that goes to uh, maintain legacy systems. Mm -hmm. So there's not as many new systems being brought on as one would like mm -hmm. to see, and there are difficulties in making sure that uh, it, the cost is properly uh, managed and that the performance is actually what you estimate it to be at that point in time. Mm -hmm. And so, so automation is definitely key, but the federal government needs to have the type of workforce that could manage, you know, we're using contractors more, we're working through other third parties more, the technology itself is becoming more sophisticated, and so you need the type of workforce that can manage this properly, and I don't think the government has, has kept pace commensurate with the complexity of maximizing the use of technology to enhance its performance. Mm. So what kind of workforce do we need? Because it seems like it would be an easy thing to say we need more STEM education throughout you know, uh, people's lives, and then when they get to their careers, they can come in and they can do these things, but with technology moving so fast, even if they come in with a degree in computer science, five, 10 years later, they might not necessarily be clued into what's going on. So yeah. what, if it's not just about pure skills uh, and technical skills, 
What are the skills and the type of people that the government needs? Yeah, we, we need higher end, higher educated people. And you see that in, if you look at the uh, type of people that have been hired in the last decade or so, it's much more higher end skills, higher educated people uh, who have experience. And I think we need people who have experience in the private sector as well as in the government sector. And we need people that can work with dis different disciplines. Mm. You know, it's very uh, uh, unusual that you'd have one discipline working by itself to solve a problem. So you need a mul uh, uh, the type of skills that people can work in a multidisciplinary kind of fashion. We do that at GAO, and that's part of our success. Uh, is because we're very multidisciplinary, but people have to work together uh, in order to, to do these skills. But the main thing I would say, you know, rather than say this skill or that skill, mm -hmm. is we need much more of a dynamic workforce planning process than what I've seen across government. In other words, you need to figure out what work you're going to be doing, what issues you're going to be doing, your strategic plan and your goals, and then you have to modify the type of skills that you have in your workforce. I do that every year at GAO. Mm. And I change the mix of skills depending upon the type of work that we think we're going to do over the next five years. Agencies need to do the same thing because it's not a static situation. Uh, you got to work at it. There's got to be leadership commitment. Uh, there's got to be continuity over time. You need to engage people. Like I have a uh, 30 member educators advisory panel of deans of major colleges and universities I meet with annually. Mm -hmm. I go out to the schools. I've been out to Carnegie Mellon, Arizona State, University of Georgia, Clark Spelman, Morehouse, Howard, Maryland. You know, I go to the schools and try to engage the students. We have very robust internship programs. And so you need to make a, a, a commitment and an effort to do this to build the type of relationships. But you need a dynamic process to uh, you know, figure out what skills you need. And for every agency, it's going to be different. Mm -hmm. I mean, there are some common skills, IT, cyber, acquisition management, if you're in a large purchasing agency. But every other agency is different. Yeah. Uh, it's very different if you're going you know, you have to talk about doctors or healthcare professionals versus petroleum engineers. I mean, it's a different type right. of uh, strategy that you need. Mm. You know, in a way, you make it sound easy, though. I mean, it sounds like a lot of hard work, but I think most federal employees uh, aren't really afraid of hard work. It's just how does that hard work translate into results? And per you know, the, the, the GAO list, uh, high-risk list, as you mentioned, this is a perennial problem. Um, it seems like, based on what you said, that 16 of those 35 areas HR uh, hiring is, and uh, uh, workforce is a direct uh, result uh, or a direct cause of many of those mm -hmm. problems. Mm -hmm. So, if hard work was all it would take to solve this, I feel like it would be solved. What's what's that other X factor that makes it so hard for federal agencies to get the people they need and keep the people they need? Well, I I, I think you need to have continuity over time and build relationships. Now, our our government in the executive branch. Uh, there is built-in turnover uh, at political leadership side. I mean, that's just the nature of our government. But you need to have to build these long-term relationships. You know, one of the distinct advantage we have at GAO is in my position, you have a 15-year term. Okay, I've been in GAO over 46 years now, right? And so I've built these relationships over time. It's, it's, it can be easy if you commit and you build the relationships over time. You know, we have 40% of our workforce is under 40. We only have about 13% of our people are eligible to retire. Now, I've got succession planning at the senior levels, you know, but, but you need commitment, continuity over time and build relationships. But the other thing is you got to make the missions of the agencies much more attractive to people. The main reason people come to GAO is because they believe in our mission. They believe in, in the fact that we're a nonpartisan organization. We're professional. It's a continual learning environment. Uh, and so you have to sell your mission. You have to sell your work life balance issues because we're always going to be at a disadvantage from a compensation standpoint. Mm -hmm. You got to compensate with work life balance issues the interesting nature of our work, but you have to sell it. I mean, people aren't gonna come without you going on and trying to convince them how exciting it is to really work for the government. 
one of the reasons I've been going to so many schools is that the, uh, the uh, deans have been asking me to come out because they believe, even people in public policy backgrounds, aren't really considering the federal government very seriously as an employer. And, and I think that's not good news no. for us. And so I go wherever, wherever I'm invited and try to, to sell the importance of public service, to sell the importance of making a difference for the country, and that our government faces a large uh, and, and growing complex set of issues. And that most of these people, like I went up to Maxwell, I gave the convocation speech this year for the graduation at the Maxwell School. And I explained to those students, I mean, you know, 20% of them, almost one in five, are going to live to be 100 years old, depending, you know, based on actuarial estimates at this point. So they got to get engaged. They have a stake in the game, and they, they need to get engaged in public service. And so we got to get that message out more broadly across the federal government to get people engaged. And internships are really a key. Mm. You know, this year we hired 220 interns. Uh, we Is that do, average for you all? Uh, it's, it, we're a little better this year, okay. but it's, we try to do between 100 and 200 every year, depending on our budget situation. And uh, you pay we, your interns. Yes, we Fantastic. pay them, we pay them, we hire them through a competitive process so that then if they like us, we like them, we can make them a job offer right you know, uh, at, the, at the time they complete their internship, once they know what our budget is going to be. And so that works out really well. But that way you get them in, they're more willing to come in a, in an internship level because they're not making a definite long-term commitment. Mm -hmm. They'll try it out, they'll see what, and we put them right to work. Yeah. You know, I've been around in, uh, in uh, compared internship programs with a lot of companies in the private sector and others. Some of them won't let them do anything except sit and observe. Mm -hmm. You know, we put them right to work uh, so that they can feel what it's like to work, the fact that we value them, we value their significance. The other thing I think it's important for government in particular is to have a commitment to diversity and inclusion. I've made that a high priority during my tenure as Comptroller General. Uh, and, uh, you know, we have 58% women now, we have over a third minorities. But if you look at the type of workforce that we have in the United States, the government, I think, has a, has a competitive advantage if it can convince people that we have a fair uh, process where anybody can succeed, no matter what your background, and that you have an atmosphere where you feel valued, respected, and treated fairly no matter where you came from mm -hmm. in this country and that the federal government has to have a workforce that's reflective of the American people and society and reflective of our elected representatives. You know, we have the most diverse Congress we've had uh, ever, uh, you know, nowadays. And, that, and if you look at the trends in the future, it's really the, in the diversity we, we can gain great strength. Excellent. So, We've heard, you, you've spoken quite a bit about what you're doing at GAO to right. internally help, but you also, in that position as GAO, you get to look at the rest of the government. You get to look at them under a microscope, so you get to look in deep. So I want to ask both sides of this, but let's, let's start with the good news. Who out there is really good at building their workforce, keeping their workforce, and keeping them happy? Who's, who's best at this, and yeah. what lessons are you pulling out from those agencies? Yeah, even though NASA has some challenges, I think NASA's uh, very good. Mm -hmm. Of course, they have an they interesting got, got cool mission. mission. Yeah. They got a, you know, they got a cool. The the uh, uh, national security agencies, mm -hmm. uh, I think, are going doing well. I mean, some of our stiffest competitions from the CIA for analysts and other 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 areas. So I think they're doing well, um, and. Uh, you know, and in, in, in some cases, uh, you know, the the areas, though, uh, that are more routine mm. kind of kind of things, where the the, the mission hasn't changed much yeah. over the years, they're the ones that are struggling a lot, or where the mission has changed, but the workforce hasn't changed commensurate to it, and they don't really have an organized way to continue to reach out to people uh, in order to do these, you know, get the right type of skills that they need, uh, you know, in there over time. And I think, you know, we've always been concerned about OPM's leadership in this area. We've made a number of recommendations over almost 29 over the past several years. 11 of them are still open. They've made some progress. 
in trying what are the high priority ones on that the high priority ones are really to have more as i mentioned a more dynamic process for workforce planning and to have it tied to the mission of the agency and the strategic goals and objectives of the agency uh, and to uh, better identify and prioritize skill gaps and they try to get ahead of it you know what i'm concerned about is that you have the situation right now where you have over 30% of the federal government's workforce is eligible to retire in the next five years. Some agencies, it's over 40%. And you have uh, a structural problem still in the system that our classification system was, you know, originally uh, birthed in 1949. So it's, you know, it's 70 years old. It's not very flexible. You know, we've made, tried to get OPM to modernize the classification system. I think this has been a problem in, in the fact that cybersecurity has come and developed and we haven't really, we're still behind mm -hmm. in adjusting it. And so we have to think ahead. Also in the future, I think artificial intelligence is going to be a big issue. Mm -hmm. It's already creeping into a number of agencies' missions, but that requires new skills. And, you know, I just formed a new science uh, technology assessment group at GAO. I've created a center for strategic foresight where we're looking ahead at the issues, but that when we're looking ahead at issues, I'm also thinking skills. Mm -hmm. and, and I think the agencies need to do that as well. And OPM needs to provide a little more leadership. Uh, you know, we don't have, there's, there's not as much as I think you could have a centralized recruiting effort for the federal government to explain its mission out there and to be more of a presence at the colleges and universities yeah. uh, around the country and kind of, you know, explain things. I mean, because, you know, we're the government perform so many essential functions and it's so critical to the social and economic fabric of our country that we need to make better investments. And so now the Congress has given agencies a lot more authorities and flexibilities. So Congress has been responsive. Though a lot of those authorities and flexibilities require wholesale rewrites of internal policies. They need backing of OPM. I mean, that's not a light switch. Right. I agree with that. I agree. And so it's got to go in tandem. And that's what our recommendations have been said. Uh, the other difficulty that we face at GAO and everybody across the government faces is budget uncertainty. I mean, here we are. We're in our you know, new fiscal year. Mm -hmm. You know, we're... Uh, and we have no idea what our budget's going to be. This is the prime recruiting time to be on colleges and universities. And, and we're there, but we're cautious in, you know, in terms of what we can offer at this point. Yeah, when you say time. government can't compete on pay, you don't mean not getting paid. Yeah, <laughs> right, right, right. No, no so, it's, it's, it's difficult. But, you know, some entry-level positions, we're pretty competitive at, yeah. the, at the government level. It's really as you go up. In, in the organization, in the organization over time, that we're less less competitive. So we're we're running short on time, and I do want to leave some time for questions. So sure. just real quick, because we've been talking a lot about just in general in government, reskilling, training, you know, getting the the workforce that wants to stay, getting them up to speed. Uh, is GAO doing any deep analysis on how those are working, the problems, the pain points, on all of those things? Yeah, we're, we're taking a look at it. We're, we've dealt deep in the cybersecurity area. Yeah. You know, I'm concerned that we're, our government's still not moving at a pace commensurate with the evolving threats in cybersecurity. It's yeah. going to get more complicated, not less. Uh, and, and particularly in, you know, it's not just information systems. I mean, it's our electricity grid we've done the work on. We've done work on our financial markets, communications. You know, there are many issues with 5G. Yeah. Uh, including national security concerns that, that need to be addressed. And, uh, you know, in terms of space and satellites and other things. And so, so we've delved very deeply into those areas. The acquisition management area, we've been uh, deeply involved there because the government's trying to procure more and more sophisticated technologies and other issues. So you need a, a more modernized acquisition workforce. Financial management's an issue, particularly at the Department of Defense. Mm -hmm. So we've been uh, dive deeply into that area. They're still the only major department that's not been able to pass the test of an independent audit. Yeah. And so, so strategically in those areas, and in many of the high risk areas that I mentioned, we'll, we'll dig into like at VA, you know, I added uh, healthcare uh, mm -hmm. For veterans, um, you know, you know, we're not getting as much. You know, we need to do better on more timely, high-quality care to veterans, and um, 
and so the workforce issues are intertwined there as well. Yeah. So let's get some, some questions out here. Uh, we've got one over there, and then we'll go number two over there if we have time. We are running a bit short, so. Okay. Hi, Rob Swamick. Um, I appreciate your frank uh, assessment of the uh, complexity of the wor uh, work is growing and, and the gaps that that's going to increase. Um, I'm curious what you think uh, for the solution, what percentage falls into um, hiring, what percentage falls into potentially more outsourcing, uh, and what percentage falls into uh, reskilling from companies like grad school and management concepts? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I, I say the way, and, and I'm best positioned to answer this from GAO. Yeah, I s solve this by um, hiring primarily. So f for me, and I think for many agencies, uh, mm -hmm. the hiring piece, and, and, and not just at entry level. You know, I hire at all levels, including a senior executive level, to bring people in. You know, I just hired our first chief data scientist from you know, a private sector background and, and uh, you know, at the senior executive level. And, and so hiring to me is, is important. Outsourcing has its own hiring implications. You know, I think what the government over the years has been looking so, okay, we don't have the skills, uh, you know, we're gonna outsource. But you gotta be able to manage the outsourcing area properly. And that's where a lot of agencies have fallen short. You know, so I have like chief I have a chief scientist, I have a chief accountant, I have a chief actuary. And so if we do do some contracting out, or even if we get consultation from experts, I have an in-house expert who I can rely on to tell me whether we're getting value and what are the right issues and you know, make sure we're getting independent advice. The government hasn't changed its workforce uh, based upon the extent of outsourcing that it's done. We've seen this in DOD, you know, we have contractors on the battlefield and in contingency operations. We've made many recommendations on how that ought to be changed to better manage in those situations. And reskilling is always important. I mean, I, you know, I, we change our tr training curriculum. I just hired somebody again from the outside as public and private experience in our learning center. You know, in our uh, profession, You've got to get continuing professional education 80 hours every two years. So we're always reskilling people within GAO and moving people around into different areas to get different experiences. When you come into GAO as an entry level person, you work in a professional development program for two years. You get rotated around the organization and different teams, and you go through an intense training program. And so, you know, we're giving people basic skills but then it's a continual learning environment throughout their career. But do you think investing in one of those categories bears more fruit, or is it really a Well, it depends on your situation. I mean, but you'll get there faster, my, my view, if you do hiring, okay? Uh, and if you, if you want a strategic outsource, you gotta think about your oversight implications, and so there's a hiring component of that. There's no magic solution, and it depends on what the skills of your current workforce really are in terms of what, what you can need and whether how much you can reskill. You know, I'm, I'm in the process now giving advice to a lot of national audit offices around the world who want to move from doing financial audits to performance audits, all right? And, and their strategy, some of them, has been, we're going to retrain all the accountants. And my, my view is, uh, you know, you, maybe you can do that, but you only get a small percent that'll either have the acumen to do that or the uh, desire to do that. So you've got to hire a whole new set of people if you want to be successful. You can't just totally reskill. So that's just an example. So it depends on where you are, what you want to be, and then you know, what's your assessment of the workforce. But I, I think any successful strategy would probably employ uh, all three of the elements in varying uh, percentages. Okay. Unfortunately, we have run, uh, out of time, but maybe you can catch him afterwards. Please join me in thanking Gene for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.